Um, again, good morning, everyone. Um, we are very, very excited to welcome you to Connecting the Dots. Uh, I am Alex Lobos. I'm the um, Director for Graduate Industrial Design uh, here at RIT. Um, and on behalf of the entire program and particularly the organization committee for this event, we welcome you. We are so excited to have you here to see, see you know, so many uh, friendly faces from you know, the, the family uh, within RIT, you know, students, alumni, uh, and also you know friends of the program. Um, so this is going to be a wonderful week. Uh, we are also super grateful uh, and, and um, you know excited to have uh, the facilitators that will be running the sessions you know this week. Uh, you know we, we were so happy that they, they all replied so quickly to our request and that it was a positive uh, plan. And I'll be honest, I, I feel that the, the plans for the workshop at the beginning were humble. And the more that we talk with fa the facilitators, the more that the program grew. Uh, so you know now we all get to benefit from it. Um, so let me uh, explain a little bit of what's going to happen this week, uh, just so that you know you 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 know what's going on. We hope that you have been receiving emails throughout the weekend, uh, you know, with details and Zoom links. Hopefully, that will get you a sense of uh, you know the the you know the, the structure that we have. But basically, uh, you know, between Monday and Friday, every day has the same structure. We will meet between 10 and 12 in the morning uh, to you know, hear from one of our wonderful facilitators. Um, these are going to be very inspirational talks you know, with very practical ideas and very thoughtful you know, calls for action. Um, after that, uh, we will, you know, provide you with an open-ended brief so that any of you who want to design, you know, uh, you know, create a design project, you know, you, you can do it and we will help you with that. So there are some templates that should be in one of your emails that you can access. Um, so after the 10 to 12 session, we will take a break. And then in the afternoon between two and four, we will have Zoom hours available. So imagine this uh, similar to office hours. If you are working on your projects, then you can go to one of the two uh, you know, Zoom uh, meetings and then meet with, you know, for example, today, you know, Patty will be available in one of the uh, calls, uh, the meetings, and I will be available on the other one. Um, so that's the, for, that's the structure for all days. Uh, along with that, uh, tonight and Wednesday evening, we will have some social hours that will be uh, you know, led by Lara and by Amos, you know, two of our wonder, uh, wonderful faculty. And those will be fun times to you know, be a little bit more relaxed and get to know each other uh, a little bit better. Um, so that will be the plan between Monday and Thursday, then Friday, we will have a panel discussion. We're actually excited because that will be the time where we will have all of our, our facilitators together uh, you know, to talk about some, some very interesting topics that our very own Kim Sherman is you know, preparing and brewing as we speak. So we are very curious to, to see you know, that unfolding and having a, a wonderful conversation. Uh, and then for those of you who are doing the design project, you will have until you know, the end of the weekend to submit your work. And then once we, we have all the work together, we will be happy to display that in an online gallery and share you know, the output of uh, this exciting week. So that is the plan. Um, you, know, you received a, uh, an email this morning with links. Obviously, you did because that's why you are here. Uh, so you will receive a, you know, a similar email every day of the week, and that will give you, you know, the different uh, Zoom links for each of the sessions. Please keep in mind that every session has a unique link. So you, you need to go back to that email and look for the session that you want to join. So I hope that made sense. And then if not, we have the entire week to figure things out. Um, that is for the structure of the program. Now, uh, it is my true you know, uh, pleasure and honor to welcome you know, our first facilitator, um, Patty Moore, you know, ID uh, class of 1974. Uh, our dear friend, our dear mentor, our dear, uh, our dear guide. Patricia Moore is an internationally renowned gerontologist and designer. Uh, she serves as a leading authority on consumer lifespan behaviors and requirements. For a period of three years, 
more travel throughout the United States and Canada, disguised as women, more uh, than 80 years of age. Moore has been named um, by ID Magazine and what, as one of the 40 most socially conscious designers in the world. In 2000, uh, by a consortium of news editors, she was named one of the 100 most important women in America. In 2019, she received the National Design Award, the highest recognition that a designer can receive in the United States. And in 2020, she received the, uh, the Center for Health Designs Change Maker Award. We are completely humbled and honored to have Patty. She is a dear friend. Uh, we are so excited for you know the inspiration and guidance that she is going to give to us now. Uh, so, Patty, thank you very much. Uh, you know the the Zoom is yours. Oh, thank you so much. Well, and happy New Year, or is it? You know, uh, we began this year um, in a very different way than we began, <clears throat> excuse me, very early for me still today. Um, then we began um, the 2020. Um, Times Square looked very different. I've only been in Times Square once. That's all you do. You do it in your 20s and you never do it again. Um, but it was, of course, um, a completely different start to this year. Um, we have been struggling with this C-19, this ugly bug. And as of today, we're looking at over 400,000 deaths in the United States alone. 24 million people have been infected. I was one of them in February. For five weeks, I ran the fever and had the back-breaking cough couldn't taste anything, um, didn't smell things properly, uh, but I was able to stay home and, and care for myself. Um, and I lived, um, and I'm grateful for that, of course, because there has been so much pain and so much grief because of the deaths. Dr. Li Rongyong uh, first warned of the virus in Wuhan hospital on February 6th of last year, uh, the hospital released a press uh, piece that said he was critically ill. On the 7th of February, he died. And we saw how quickly this virus spread. But my thoughts turned immediately to the virus of the flu uh, pandemic in 1918. My grandfather died in that pandemic, as did so many millions of people around the world. Hospitals were very different. Technology for health, very different. In Wuhan, a state-of-the-art hospital was built in 10 days to address the pandemic. There was no shortage of PPE and patients were treated aggressively. In 1918, our tools were very different than they are today. This is a matter of science, of engineering, and most important, design. And it's interesting to note from the historical archives that the situations about attitudes and reactions by people, by ourselves, were very similar in 1918 as they are today. People were against masking. People didn't want to stay away from crowds. Just as today, we have the same reaction. Some people will wear a mask. Some people will not. Some people plan to vaccinate and others say no. This is a matter of design. And so what I hope to accomplish today is to give all of us some thinking some background, some inspiration about what comes next. In 1952, my parents were terrified. My mother was about to give birth to me and we had another epidemic. It was polio. Polio froze the body. These are iron lungs. 
They helped people breathe when lungs physically weren't able to do it on their own. And we fought and worked very hard for a vaccine. The first vaccine came from Dr. Salk. It was an injection. And the second vaccine came from Dr. Sabin the following year in 1955. And that was on a sugar cube. I remember being in the line with my fellow students and in my preschool having the sugar cube. I don't remember the taste. I don't remember much more than that. But what I do recall was I didn't hear anything about fear or anger. I heard about compliance. It was a different time with polio. And maybe our most uh, recognizable patient for polio was Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the president. And at the time we hid his disease. We were afraid people might think a president couldn't be president if he was using a wheelchair. It was a much different attitude in our country about power. One of the things that FDR did as a result of his personal experience with polio was to start the March of Dimes. The March of Dimes still exists today, raising money for all sorts of disease around the planet. And at the time it funded the vaccination. And by the way, Dr. Sabin and Dr. Salk never made a penny on their discoveries. They refused to patent their formulas. So I'm going to look at a variety of opportunities that we as designers can embrace today. And I'm going to start here with communication. I think some of the saddest images we've all shared was knowing people couldn't touch physically anymore, couldn't hug, couldn't give people comfort. It was heartbreaking to see our elders in skilled nursing care, confused perhaps with dementias and Alzheimer's, other diseases that made it uncertain to them why their loved ones weren't coming inside, why they weren't visiting. Several years ago, doctors and nurses recognized the importance of being able to see the face as fully as possible, even when masked. And the communicator was the first patented design. Clear mask is a design that came out of this pandemic. And of course I have my RIT mask, which by the way, I would design differently because it's a little hard to put on, but I love it. And when I walk around Phoenix wearing it, I'm amazed that people stop me and wanna talk about what it is, what it's for. And they're equally amazed when they realize, oh yes, some people need to see your mouth in order to communicate. So it's a design lesson. Sadly, as I walk around Phoenix on my daily walks, um, I don't see anyone wearing a mask. That's a problem. These nurses who worked in an elder care setting realized how hard it was for their patients to see them, to hear them, to understand them because of the mask. And so they put their photos on their uniforms so people could remember what they looked like. In a healing environment, the human factor is key. And what we have seen in this pandemic is a complete obliteration of that feature. We haven't allowed visitors, we couldn't. We haven't been able to hug and hold and comfort and care. And it's been heartbreaking. And every picture I see and every news story I read makes me think as a designer, what can I do? What should be done? What could be done by design? I'm looking also at the fatigue of our frontline brave service providers, staff of all kinds, from the janitor who's cleaning to the nurses that are trying to save our lives. And I'm looking at the technology. This unit uh, was designed in Denmark several years ago. And of course now it's being distributed as rapidly as possible because it is cleansing 
without needing staff, the healthcare environment and keeping them safe. In Japan, this robot is also doing um, sterilizations and cleaning of surfaces, freeing up staff, human staff, and making it safer. Within this healing umbrella, we also have the importance of our networks. Telemedicine has been primary. I've been receiving a great deal of my care on my computer screen. It's nothing like being with my doctor, but it gives me a certain level of confidence that I'm doing well. How people have been feeling during the pandemic has become a central issue for design. Trail Talk is a mobile psychiatric device that allows people to continue to get treatment, to abate their fears and their concerns. Because as we know, we're seeing suicides rise during this pandemic. And another forgotten consumer in all of this and a consumer at high risk is anyone who needs assistance in their home for their lifestyle. We're seeing so much uh, rejection, sadly, because we don't have enough personnel. This tsunami has been upon us for decades and we've yet to do anything about it. And as a designer, I'm very frustrated because so much of my work today is in physical medicine and rehabilitation. And I wonder, how can design answer this call? Our homes are healing us more than ever before as we're quarantined. Elders like me, someone over 65, technically an elder, are at higher risk. And I've been reliant on service personnel bringing me my groceries. I wait for the mail carrier every day just so I can give them a wave and see someone and have a little chat. In Holland, the first recognition of skilled care residents being so terribly lonely for their family and friends was addressed with this transformation of a potting cottage. And so through a glass wall, we can still say hello to one another and have a chat because of the technology. We're seeing workplace redefined. And I'm one of the people that's happy to see that the open office place might go away after we come out of our homes and return to workplaces, or if we ever do. Designers are thinking about repurposing office towers all over the world. How we work and where we work has been changed forever by design. We're seeing that women all over the world are suffering in particular in the workforce because the woman, the mother, was the first to leave the job if a choice had to be made and care for their children in their home. Now, I have to say, my mother never would have tolerated this kind of messing around if she was working. So each parenting situation, of course, is very unique, but every designer has to be aware of those discrete needs and address them. When you ask designers and architects, how does your home office look? You get this sort of representation. I think this is a lot of fun to see the architects and designers from KPF sending in sketches of what they're doing in their homes. Education has been fundamentally changed by the emptying of classrooms all over the globe. And what it's shown, unfortunately, is the technology disparity that exists for some students over others. People who don't have access to a computer are having difficulty keeping their children educated in their homes alone. And teachers are having to become interior designers and architects as they reconfigure classrooms when they begin to open. One of the most heartbreaking aspects of the quarantines has been 
the change in the capacity to worship. Just when people need reassurance more than ever before, they can't go to their church. They can't go to speak to the person that soothes their soul. If they can visit, they have to visit differently. They have to celebrate ceremony in ways never thought before. And as we try all over the world to keep our places of worship safe and secure, we're seeing still sadly the inability of design to make a significant response as yet. Food insecurity has been at its worst in the pandemic. Food banks all over the world are finding themselves unable to keep up with the need. People who've lost their jobs, unable to afford food. Meals on Wheels not only provides much necessary food each day for elders at home, but socialization, just the kindness of a few moments of conversation with the person who's bringing you the one hot meal you'll have each day. Our frontline people in food services are struggling. They've been very brave, staying in their jobs and trying their best to remain healthy. I'm sorry, but as we know, a simple plexiglass shield like this is not stopping an aerosol born contagion. Design has a lot of work to do in every environment where people gather. Every piece of technology in every experience, inclusive of the retail experience, has got to change. Delivery and services have been changing dramatically. At Arizona State University, this little guy delivers your hamburger and fries and maybe a shake. And in my neighborhood, the margarita truck was a very welcome sight. Exercise. You don't really think about it till you can't have it. And watching little children not being able to play as little children should has been particularly heartbreaking for me. Even the doggy park in my neighborhood has been sealed off. The gym experience has been taken away from us. But I have to admit, personally, after my 20s, my gym was in my home anyhow. I don't like the idea of thinking about the interface with equipment with other people and having to trust if they've been safe and secure. But this is an industry that's under attack because of the failure of design. And so we're seeing exercise change very dramatically in this past year with magic mirrors and interactive equipment and even hopefully safe bubbles. I haven't been on an airplane since February 12th of 2020. That's pretty remarkable for someone who is, who's averaged 250 days of travel each year since the early 1980s. I don't know when I'll fly again. I hope it'll be soon. I don't know what it's going to feel like. I just remember going through TSA and now it's even more rigorous. In fact, one of the trips that got canceled for last March was coming to RIT and I was ready. I had your shamrock origami. I still have them. <laughs> Hopefully I'll get to bring them next St. Patrick's Day. But things have changed. How we act within the travel environment has had to change. How we behave is made to change. And by design, the future of travel will be defined. Go Bills. And even managing some spectators, you have to wonder how many people are being infected, but they bravely go to the games now. 
as allowed, or do they? I have found this, this piece a little creepy. I feel like I'm in a Twilight Zone episode as it is, but I don't know, these, these poor um, athletes having to look into the stands and seeing this, I'm sure they have sleepless nights. But we tried bubbles and they've been successful. My favorite though, was this formulated distancing for football. I find that absolutely fascinating that someone has decided that encounter time will in fact save you from disease. But this tells you how crazy we are about our sports and how insistent we are that we play. You know, the best designers, I believe, are first and foremost anthropologists and sociologists. Every time we look at a scene, we should be evaluating, taking in the information, thinking about how we're going to use it. I want you to look at this picture. And later I'm going to ask you what you saw. Audience experiences have changed. I can't remember the last time I was at a movie. I like going to see my films in a theater. But the theater experience might be something that we don't have in future. In Barcelona, to see this performance was both creative, but also heartbreaking. To see the spatial distancing required in order to enjoy the arts is soul breaking. And I am so very heartbroken for students who aren't able to graduate in a crowd. But maybe this was the saddest thing I saw in all the images I collected in this past year. Not being able to say hello to Santa or start crying and screaming like some little kids do, but putting Santa in a bubble so at least he can wave hello to the children. So now here we are design. We're at a point for vaccination. We're ready for rollouts. We're doing our best as we can. Each state seems to be responding in its own different and unique way. The jabs have started with elders first and frontline workers. And in Italy, we've seen a beautiful concept emerge, understanding that by design, maybe we can influence attitude. And that maybe a hospital setting or a car park isn't the best place to get your inoculation. So this brings us to the point of branding and the importance of branding in design. I can't eat at Burger King. There's something in their special sauce that gives me hives, but I've been watching the rollout this year of their new logo with a little bit of bemusement. Take a look at 1969, 1994, and hello, 2021. <laughs> no, you're not seeing things. 1969, 1994, <laughs> 2021, and somebody got a lot of money for this change in the size of the bun. I'm just saying. I do this quite deliberately just to kind of poke at ourselves here a minute. Creating imagery that says who we are by design is of course big business. And then it causes lots of feedback, whether you want it or not. And for the record, I am not fond of the new GM logo. I think I've seen it before and it's not been on a vehicle. Some rebranding has come as a result of social reckoning. And the reckoning in this country of the sadness that comes from looking at indigenous peoples in very wrong ways. So the rebranding of the Washington football team has been a life lesson for us all. Actually, the branding is about the message. 
Now, some messages, very matter of fact, just wear your mask. But maybe because we are so unique and we are so sensitive and we are who we are, we need a softer cell. We need a little art and design. We need a sense of choice and control. The recent uh, loss of another flight, um, painful as it is, as forensically by design, we try and figure out what happened, brings us to this kind of messaging, which I have to share, I found absolutely abhorrent. The last thing families need is to go to a help center with a graphic such as this, showing an intact aircraft for families who are struggling to accept the fact that an aircraft had total failure and is in the bottom of the ocean with their loved ones. This is one of the worst messagings that I've seen designed recently. And so it reminds us all how very serious, not just what we say is, but how we say it. We, the people all of us, everywhere throughout the world. Hopefully living peacefully together as one family. That's the dream, that's the goal. Martin Luther King Jr. on the 28th of August in 1963 stood before 250,000 people gathered in Washington, D.C. for the Freedom March, where there was not a single arrest, no violence, but a peaceful gathering to speak about equality and equity for all. He had a dream, and it's, I think, a great dream. I think it's all of our dreams for recognition, for understanding, for acceptance, to know that we should all of us be able to hold hands and stick together, not pull apart. On November 22nd, 1963, I was a child student at school when President Kennedy was assassinated. I remember the day very distinctly because it was the first time I saw adults cry. Wherever I looked, every adult I knew was in tears. My parents, my grandparents, my teachers. I remember being sent home from school. I remember the television being on. I remember the only sound you heard was sniffling and whispers. We were a nation in shock. Our president had been assassinated. She was only 32, Jacqueline Kennedy, our first lady. And she wore the suit that was stained with her husband's blood and brain matter that entire day with deliberateness telling the reporters, let them see what they have done. And she stood beside now President Johnson as he took the oath on Air Force One. And President Johnson continued the work for equity and equality. He signed the Civil Rights Act in 1964, reminding us all that we had to come together, all people, all colors, all religions, all ages, all abilities, if our nation was to remain whole. A year later, seen here with Martin Luther King, he signed the Voter Rights Act, hopefully taking away discrimination against any American citizen and their ability to vote. And then Martin Luther King was assassinated.
we have rights, but we also have responsibilities. And I think it's important at this time to remind ourselves as designers who deliver powerful messages and quality of life all over the globe, that our right is to assemble, but peaceably. When President Washington was inaugurated, I'm sure he couldn't have imagined what we face today. And on Wednesday, when we have the inauguration of our 46th president, let us hope it's with the peace that comes with remembering we're all one people. Let's hope that our governance is able to work towards that control of equity and equality for all. My beloved grandfather survived World War I as a sailor. He made a pact with a Canadian friend that if they did come back alive, they'd build a cottage in Canada and that's where my grandfather spent every summer after the war, happily fishing in a little red rowboat. And when I came along, I was by his side, being brave, putting the worm on my hook and sitting for hours with my grandpa, just listening to the brightest man I have ever known. He only went through the fourth grade, but he had the biggest heart and soul and he loved everybody as equal. And he particularly loved Mr. Magoo here, the meanest dog in the world, whose sole purpose was to protect my grandfather, who no longer could walk as a result of his injuries from the war. My grandfather had a favorite little ditty, a little poem. Whenever you'd come home from school with an F on a test or you didn't get your way with your sisters or your friends, he'd give us a squeeze and wipe away our tears and remind us that in this life, you have to do more than just look. You wanna see. And you have to do more than simply hear. Make sure you're listening to people. If you can do more than simply speak, say something and definitely try your best to do more than just exist. Know you're here to make a difference by design. Thank you so much for the time today.